Hello, everyone. Okay, so this was a surprise. Did not see this coming. Uh, of course, there is some irony given the fact that this is um, pretty much the same week that we went on quarantine initially. It's kind of a bummer. I feel like I jinxed it by talking about that a lot, but what are you going to do? Uh, okay, so the way things are going to go, I'm going to make a schedule for uh, streaming tomorrow. But generally, I'm just going to upload a video to my YouTube channel and put it in the posts section of Microsoft Teams. So I think y'all can, can see me do this. I know your view is a little different, but you should like just go to the team um, and not use these sidebar buttons to look at my posts, right? I'm going to make an assignment for today to help guide people. But I know last time we had a e-learning day that was an issue. Um, I do want to stream our homework check tomorrow, but then after that, I'll just make videos for Thursday, probably nothing for Friday because it'll just be a test day. And then next week, I think it'll be the same. I'll make videos on Monday, Tuesday, stream for a homework check and on Wednesday, and then a, a, a test on, hmm, actually next week is for a uh, four day week. So if anything, I'll probably stream on Thursday, and then again, you'll have a Friday of just taking some online test. Um, okay, so I'll post that, but the schedule for tomorrow streaming, it's just gonna be what your class is. So uh, if you're in first period, the class starts at 7.40, second period, 8.40, um, and then I have a fifth period class. I guess you guys can uh, come to the stream at 12 o'clock. And seventh period, 9B, y'all would come into it at 150. I know that's a little, little late, but like I said, it'll just be that one day of the week that I'm streaming. So might as well catch that one because otherwise it won't be live. It'll just be these videos that I'm posting to YouTube. But otherwise, we'll do things normally. You can turn in your homework by Wednesday night through Teams or email or messaging if you have trouble with that. But okay, the schedule is not gonna actually change um, this is kind of funny now. I made a slide about people not using devices since that had been a problem recently. But I guess it's not going to be a problem for the next two weeks. Or three, including spring break. This is the chapter 14 vocabulary. So um, let's see. Yeah, I guess the test will be the same. I'll really try to pick some of the easy ones here. Because as, as you can see, we have some, some doozies. Animal, okay, that's going to be tough to remember. But that's third declension. Aqua, I'm sure you can uh, associate with uh, being water. Ars artis also basically just looks like art, which is what it is. It can also be like skill. Oris or aurus, aurus is ear. That's one of these new third declension nouns where the is ending is the nominative singular ending and the genitive singular ending, which is a little weird, but it's not that weird. So we call those, that's what these I stem third declension nouns are that we're learning about this chapter. Um, and yeah, aural, I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, uh, but A-U-R-A-L is things having to do with hearing. Kiwis, kiwis, uh, is citizen. Um, again, masculine and genitive is the same. Eos, iuris is right or law. Try to think of that I as being like a J, so it almost looks like justice or like jurisdiction. Um, but, uh, yeah, that one's a little tricky. It almost looks like like not a full word or something. Uh, mare, maris, I think that's pretty easy to remember. I'll probably put it on the test. Moris mortis is death, but you might get it mixed up with mos moris, which is habit or custom. Nubes is cloud, we looked at that yesterday. Os oris is mouth or face. So we're getting a couple like, uh, I guess like body parts is the word for it. We get, we're getting ear and mouth. Um, os, I, I try to remember because like, it, it almost looks like the word is just an O. So it looks like somebody opening their mouth or something. Pars partis is part, it's really easy. That often goes with a genitive as in like part of something. Roma is Rome. Turba is uproar or like a disturbance. Okay, we get words like turbidity, um, turbulence. So it's something that's like kind of chaotic, but it also sometimes denotes like a crowd of people. Um, Herbs, herbis, the city is pretty easy. Vis is that really weird one that's four. So we're having a lot of nouns this chapter, and, and almost all of them are third declension except for Turba and Roma, I guess, and Aqua. So three first declension ones. Trons is a new preposition that means a cross, and it takes an accusative, 
And then we have five verbs. I'll probably put three of them on the test. And then I'll put trons because you need to know trons. Oh, and I'm sorry, ah and ob is also another preposition that takes an ablative and it means away from. So you're probably thinking, uh, if you know X and day well, why do we have a third from? It's kind of confusing. It will eventually do something else besides from or be translated as something else, but for now it's from. I will put both of those prepositions on the test, three of the verbs and then five nouns. Um, and I'll throw in at least one or two of the easier nouns like animal, aqua, mare, or pars. I probably won't put Roma. It's a little too easy. Um, but yeah, curro is run. Look at that weird third principal part, kakuri. Apello, apellare. Um, you might think if you know any French, je m'appelle. It means like my name is. So there's a etymological connection there. But it means to like call out or to name something. Muto is to change, think of mutant. Teneo is to hold, and veto is to avoid. We're starting to get a lot of V, or we have vivo at least, and it's kind of easy to mix up vivo. Vivo, vineo, video, we do have a lot of V verbs. All right, but that is the vocab. All right, I won't linger on this too long, but I am determined to get through. Um, Talk about Julius Caesar in the Ides of March, even if it's no longer in person. Why is that? Okay. Um, but anyway, in almost all my classes yesterday, I'll keep this brief, and then we're going to do a little translation of the story that I posted on Teams, and that'll be that. Okay, no way. It's going to be more than a 25-minute video. Um, in almost all my classes, I basically got to the point where Julius Caesar defeated Pompey, which was kind of surprising because Pompey was so well known as a really great and competent general. Julius Caesar wins against his army in Greece after he's crossed the Rubicon and basically claimed all of the Italian peninsula for his own. We have all these senators fleeing to other parts of the Republic that aren't Julius Caesar's territory, which at this point contains France and Italy or Gaul, I should say. Um, and so he kind of has to chase these senators around. They're mostly in Greece and or actually Africa uh, and kind of hunt them down. He doesn't have all of them killed. Um, people like Cicero, even though Cicero sides with Pompey, is pardoned by Julius Caesar. So he does pardon people. And he likely would have pardoned Ptolemy as well. But after Ptolemy's defeat, he goes to Egypt thinking he can get Ptolemy the 13th to uh, aid him and kind of form an alliance with him but he is betrayed by Ptolemy the 13th. Ptolemy the 13th thinks that Julius Caesar will like this. Julius Caesar does not really like this. Uh, he decides to side with Cleopatra, who shows up in his, uh, the kind of palace where he's being kept by Ptolemy. Um, and he sides with her against Ptolemy. We have the siege of Alexandria that lasts for a couple of months. Um, and Julius Caesar and Cleopatra are victorious. This counts as a victory for Julius Caesar. He spends some time with Cleopatra. He has a couple of other things to, to some, some loose ends to tie up. And then he returns to Rome to celebrate a whopping four triumphs. Don't know if we've talked about these triumphs in all of my classes, but this is when a uh, Roman general would have a celebration. It's basically a big parade um, that would be held when Roman generals returned from a successful campaign and a lot of loot uh, would be on display, like loot that was claimed by the Roman army or legions um, from the campaign that they won. Sometimes even prisoners claimed from the enemy side would be kind of like uh, in a procession and chains. So there's kind of, of a brutality to it. Uh, but this is, he had four in a row, back to back. So for four days, Romans would celebrate these and all kinds of Romans would show up, poor, rich, everyone would kind of show up to these triumphs and partake in the merriment. If you've ever been to a parade, it's basically like that, except there is a element of like military pomp to it. Uh, and so they were celebrating triumphs in Asia Minor, uh, something Julius Caesar had to do really quick after the whole Egyptian uh, excursion. It's the same campaign that he referred to uh, by saying, Vici, I came, I saw, I conquered, and, and some letter that he wrote someone at the, around the time. Um, also Egypt, that's what he was doing with Cleopatra. Africa as well, you might think is in Egypt and Africa, but this is another part of Africa that's to the um, west of Egypt. It's uh, like the part more just like 
to the south of Italy. I'm actually in the building right now. I'm not technically supposed to, um, even though I ironically finished vaccinating. But okay, and also Gaul, right? Because he spent eight years conquering all of Gaul, which is this new huge territory for Rome. But anyway, this all happens. I will say there was one interesting thing during the Egyptian triumph. They are uh, leading Cleopatra's sister, Arsinoe, uh, in chains to be essentially executed at the end of the triumph. And the Roman onlookers are kind of disgusted by this because they all they see is this young princess. Uh, and so they, they just start booing and they don't like that, you know, they know that she's going to be executed. They think that's wrong, um, maybe because of her age or because she was a woman. I'm, it's kind of unclear, but I mean, who wouldn't understand why people would be kind of upset by this? Um, it's kind of a surprising amount of humanity from ancient Romans. And so they decide not to kill Arsinoe. Instead, they kind of put her up in like a house arrest situation somewhere in Rome, but she she lives somewhat decently uh, instead of dying that day. So that's good. Um, as much as, like, well, we should talk more about Cleopatra. She's really cool. But she basically sentences all of her family to death, uh, which is interesting. Um, anyway, and then, of course, we have a couple of years, about three, where Julius Caesar is this dictator. And before he leaves on a campaign to Asia in uh, 44 BCE, we have the Ides of March, wherein uh, Julius Caesar's good friend, apparently, and maybe illegitimate son. That's that's just kind of speculation. We really don't have too much reason to believe that. But I'm talking about Brutus. Brutus, this Roman senator, is apparently kind of swayed by Cassius to join this band of conspirators. This is played up by historians, and then it's ran with, with Shakespeare and his version of uh, events in the play Julius Caesar. And of course, the senators kill Julius Caesar because in their minds, they are protecting their idea of democracy and upholding this Roman value that is very opposed to kings or monarchs or tyrants, whatever word you want to use for an autocratic kind of uh, concentration of power. Um, but so it, it's, a, it's a weird gray area where I think a lot of them had uh, good intentions deep down, but it did not result in um, in uh, the, the restoration of the Roman Republic by any means. What it leads to essentially is Octavian becoming the first actual emperor. Julius Caesar wasn't technically an emperor. He kind of refused any title that would make him uh, too kingly, though imperator was technically his, his uh, or dictator, dictator. Um, but that's a little different. That was, that was a title that had been used previously for, for like emergency situations. But Augustus becomes um, emperor in 27. So there is actually, it's like, what is that? Uh, 42 to 27 is um, 15. So there's 15 years where we have this power struggle between Octavian, who is, you know, becomes Augustus. Once he becomes emperor, he kind of renames himself. Uh, and this is just a nephew of Julius Caesar. They knew each other a little bit, but not that well. And yet Julius Caesar does not have a son of age. He did actually have a child with Cleopatra, Caesarion, but that kid would have been like a baby when all of this was happening. So Octavian is the one in Julius Caesar's will, much to Mark Antony's chagrin, since Mark Antony was Julius Caesar's right-hand man. Uh, I think he half expected that he might be in the will. Octavian, Antony, and then this third guy, Lepidus, they form this alliance temporarily that we can call the second triumvirate but just like the first triumvirate it starts with good intentions for these three ambitious men to work together and eventually degenerates into infighting and uh, on and off conflicts between Octavian and Antony there is um, this kind of weird twist uh, in that Octavian I'm sorry Mark Anthony um, becomes entangled with Cleopatra. So Cleopatra is was not technically ever married to Julius Caesar, but she almost functioned as like the second wife in a weird way that was very salacious and kind of controversial at the time. But Mark Anthony starts um, having a relationship with her. Octavian actually plays this to his benefit. He kind of like puts out a lot of PR, talking about how Octavian, I'm sorry, Mark Anthony, keep calling me, uh, 
is more interested in this foreign queen than Rome itself. And that, you know, he spreads rumors that Mark Anthony wants to move the capital of Rome to Alexandria, which was likely unfounded. And ultimately, there is a battle between Mark Anthony and Octavian. It's a naval one um, near Greece, and uh, Octavian wins. Mark Anthony, he, he has this territory, like this territory kind of belongs to him around Greece and um, Egypt. But uh, he has the inferior navy or naval ability um, compared to Octavian. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that Cassius and Brutus, they had to flee from Rome after assassinating Julius Caesar, and they have some battles with Octavian and Mark Anthony, and they both lose and die in and around Greece years before this has happened. But anyway, um, Octavian wins against Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. Mark Anthony and Cleopatra kind of surrender, um, take their own lives, and uh, Octavian is the last man standing. He even has, this is a live action from the, from like a TV show about Rome, a actor portraying Caesarian in the lower right. And that's a statue apparently in the upper right of Caesarian. This is the son of the deceased Julius Caesar and now deceased Cleopatra. Uh, he wouldn't have been more than 10 or 15. It's a little unclear. We have very little information on him. Um, 10 to 15, I should say. Uh, and he is sought out and apparently um, he's taken out by Octavian because Octavian understands that if this, you know, blood heir of Julius Caesar is still out there in the world, that it poses a threat to his claim to Julius Caesar's um, throne, basically, to use that word a little loosely. And so, yeah, that's kind of brutal. Um, who knows what that kid would have grown up to do. But here we are at, a, at the arrival of the first emperor of Rome. Uh, the newly minted Roman Empire in 27 BCE, that is 2,048 years ago. And uh, he changes his name to Augustus, which means like the illustrious one, is the special one. So he's a little full of himself. Um, but if Julius Caesar left you as the heir to his will, you probably would be too. And historians tend to look at Augustus pretty favorably. Um, uh, Rome finally was kind of done with civil wars for a little while, which was huge because they had been plagued by them since Julius Caesar was a little kid. You know, like all through Julius Caesar's life, there were these on and off uh, conflicts within Rome itself. They're still expanding their territories on the boundaries of the empire uh, and fighting wars in that way. But at least within Rome, they are not in fighting. Um, he has a lot of massive um, building projects and kind of uh, beautification attempts in terms of making Rome look nicer. Uh, and other li little like quality of life things like uh, initiating um, policemen, these Vigilis. Uh He banished Ovid, my favorite poet, because apparently maybe Ovid had an affair with his daughter. So uh, for that, I definitely don't like Augustus. But he also, he made up for this by patroning Virgil and, and encouraging Virgil to write the Aeneid and releasing it uh, or publishing it even after Virgil died prematurely and not completing it. But anyway, uh, he died in 14 um, CE. That is CE, right? I'm almost positive. Don't know why it says BCE. Okay, now we can move on to the next thing, which is translation based. I'm just checking that. I get it's weird. The people who are living right around the shift from CE to BCE or BCE to CE, I should say. Um, yeah, 14 AD, right? CE just means AD. Should probably just go back to using AD and BC. Um, it's a little less confusing. Uh, anyway, he dies in 14. And then from there, we have um, Titus. And then we have other emperors that we've covered briefly. I might cover again. All right, the reading we have today is about this Phoenician woman, Europa. Um, and uh, uh, Jupiter turning into an animal. Go figure. So it's in the teams. So try to go print that out. I'll wait. You can pause the video. Why is that? I'm still there. But yeah, some people like to theorize. Like this is about this one Europa, who is a Phoenician woman, uh, which those are we, we call them Libyan people as well. People living in mod, like in and around modern day Libya or Syria. Uh, these Phoenicians or Tyrians, they're actually the ones who will colonize Carthage. So Carthage actually is a Tyrian colony, at least initially. 
Um, some people think this is a metaphor, like since this is about this woman traveling from um, modern day Libya uh, to Greece, that it's almost a metaphor for the fact that the Phoenician alphabet influenced uh, to Greece, not Rome, to Greece actually. I'm um, sorry, but yeah. Anyway, like like almost that has some some uh, some parallel to the fact that the Greek alphabet was inspired by the Phoenician one. All right, let's just do the first paragraph of it. Tomorrow we'll stream the homework check. I'll finish the story on Thursday and go over the vocabulary one more time. And like I said, Friday it's just going to be one of the homework sentences and ten of the words I already basically said what the words are going to be. And that'll be the week. We'll have a four-day week next week. I'll actually be kind of like three, since again, you'll have a test on Friday. All right, Europam, Philiam, Agonoris, Jupiter, Rex Deorum, Weed it. All right, there's a lot of names in this. All right, I'm seeing Jupiter's name. See Europa's name. She's first declension, though, and I'm seeing that she is not in her subject form. And then we have Agonor. I think his name only comes up once, but he's just her dad, this uh, Phoenician king. So Agonor, Agonoris. All right, so who is my actual subject? He's in a weird spot. It's a he. And I see my verb at the end is from video videri. It's third person. So I do just need to he or she or it. Third person singular. So it's actually just Jupiter. It's Jupiter saw Europa. So we're starting with a direct object. Europalm with the A in there was in her, she's in her accusative singular forms. That's the direct object. Jupiter in the middle of the sentence is actually the subject. I know his name looks crazy like that with an I, but hopefully you're kind of used to it at, that, at this point. Uh, that is his name in the nominative. Um, and he's third declension. Like in other forms, he looks like Jove. It's like Jovis, Jovi, Jovum. Um, but here it, it, it kind of looks like Jupiter. If you take away one of the P's and make the I into a J. So Jupiter saw or has seen Europa. Who is Europa? They tell us more about both of these people, actually. So it's not just Jupiter. It's Jupiter, the Rex Deorum. What is the ending of Deorum telling us? Should look like a genitive plural to you. So it's Jupiter, king of the gods, um, saw Europa, daughter of Agenor. And I forgot to color code da daughter of Agenor. But um, daughter is just kind of, a, what's the word? It's an object complement. It's also accusative to go with Europa. It's telling us more about who Europa is. Um, and Agenor is genitive, just like Deorum is genitive. If you look at Agonor's dictionary entry, like it's Agonor, Agonoris. So Agonoris is the possessive form, third declension, right? Uh, also, read it is perfect tense. How do I know that? Mostly because of the macron over the I. Uh, video, videri, it's a short I in the present, future, and imperfect forms. And vidi, it turns into a long I. So vini, vidi, vici, uh, vini, vidi, vici right? Um, it's, it's that verb. Um, okay, but it's third person singular there. Nope. Um, let's see. Victus Amora Aeus. The note tells us Victus means conquered by. Um, it's we'll get the grammar for that eventually, but it's kind of just like an adjective. But Amora is gonna be the thing that it's that someone is conquered by. So it's conquered by love, but it's not just by anyone's love, it's Aeus Amora, so it's conquered by his love, he said. Uh, and then I guess this is Jupiter talking. Sine hoc bella femina ego non potera vivra said quid agam. So sine hoc bella femina is actually pretty easy. Then it gets a little weird. But that should be, is it going to be without this beautiful one or that beautiful woman? It is this because it's from Hickey Cox. So it's this. Uh, and those should be green. They're the object of sine. Um, I ego non potero. Hopefully Patro rings a bell and looks like our possum friend. It's possum and it's first person singular, but what the heck tense is it? Cause it's not, you know, possum as I can. What is potero? Is it future or past tense? Like imperfect. It's actually future. Look at the weird future tense versions of this verb, potero, I will be able to, poteris, you will be able to, et cetera. It's very long winded to translate the future tense of possum. You just need will and be and able two, all, all, all four of those words. Um, and yeah, the, the pattern for four out of six of them is E-R-I. But the first person singular is just E-R-O and the last one is E-R-U-N-T. So it's kind of it's kind of tricky. So I wanted to gloss the whole thing. So he said, I will not be able to live. Um, but said, quid agam. Remember, agu agar is just like to do or act. 
but it's a third conjugation verb. So it has a horrible first person singular future tense ending. But that is what we're seeing there. You might look at that and think noun. It's actually first singular feature verb. So it's, but what will I do? All right, real quick, let me make, make these green on ablatives this chapter. This, though, is not one of our new ablatives of means of manner or accompaniment, but we will be seeing one of those soon. If anything, it's like the opposite. It's like um, the ablative of not accompaniment. We do get something called the ablative of separation later, but I don't believe that this counts as that. Um, okay, moving on, let's do a few more sentences. So Jupiter is up to his old, weird, typical thing, um, falling in love with humans. Hyquergo, uh, C-A-M-V, superabo. So this maiden, if, um, if, and it gets a little weird, so V is one of these, this new verb, it's in the ablative actually, but it's just floating there. It's that weird uh, word for like force or strength. But like I said, like it's not next, uh, AM is not a preposition. It might look like one, but AM should mean her, let's accuse it. So this maiden, if I will overcome her, supera, but we haven't seen supera, supera in a while. Overcome her comma power, force, I'm not sure what to do with that. So that is one of our new ablatives, and it is an ablative of means. Okay, so it's one of the mean ones that doesn't give us a preposition. This maiden, if I will overcome her with power. You have to add the with yourself just because we have an ablative floating around without a preposition, and we don't know what else to do with it. Um, so that's that's exactly what that is. Power almost, because that's not an innate, like a specific object. So this almost feels like it could be ablative of, of manner. Um, but it is means mostly because there is no kum, which that's that's kind of the most important thing. Okay, may non amabit. Um, amabit is third person, so we're talking about like a he or she. I guess we're talking about she, the maiden. She will not love me. These verbs are future tense, but I put the first will in parentheses because it sounds awkward um, in the context of a condition to say if I will do something. So if I overcome her with power, she will not love me. And and that's Juno. Okay, ignore the weird I and Juno. My wife, Uxor, we have not seen Uxor in a long time. Uh, and this is, there's a lot going on in the sentence. If something about my plots and Vinnyet, I'm on the second line there, that, that second to last verb means to find third singular. We're probably talking about Juno, right? Um, and Juno, my wife, if she will find out my plots or like discover my plots, they gloss Costigo for us as to punish, she will punish me. So this is weird. This is like a double condition. And it's two separate conditions and results in the same sentence. This maiden, if I overcome this maiden, she will not love me. A Juno, my wife, she will punish me. So he's trying to figure out how to, I guess, hang out with Europa without his wife knowing about it. Um, art to Igatoi Dukura de Beo. Okay, let's see. I'm sorry, I just got an email threw me off. Um, Arta is this new word, ours, Arta's third declension. That E, I know third declension's maybe a little rusty for some of us, but that's ablative. So to me, it looks kind of like we're having an ablative float around without a preposition. Igator is not a preposition, it just means therefore. It's not like one of our prepositions like in or sine, you know, without or cum or de or x or pro. Uh, Europam, that looks like her direct object form. Ad me, something like to me. Ducra de Beo. So that's going to be I, it's never O, it's going to be I should lead Europa to me, therefore. What do we, in the comma art skill? So that's another habit of a means. So it's like with skill, therefore I should lead Europa to me. And then I think I have like one or two more. Jupiter, oh no, I, I don't think I actually did this one. So let's, uh, okay. We'll do this last one, and that'll be it. Jupiter, something, Sibi is one of our reflexive pronouns, something about, like, maybe to himself. Dead it, it might look crazy, but it's from Dodare. It's the perfect tense version of to give. So it's like Jupiter gave himself. What did he give himself? The form of a bull. Okay. Uh, cum caleritate. Caleritas, was that in, is that, I guess that is one of our new words. I didn't see it in the, maybe I just forgot to add it. 
Uh, but it means speed. Think of like accelerate or celery. Because I bet if you eat a lot of celery, um, that's probably good for runners trying to stay in shape. <laughs> I don't actually know. Um, so with speed, this is a pretty cool sentence. I'll do this one and then we'll be done. Because we have like four or five prepositional phrases in, in one sentence. If you look at the end, I'm seeing kukurit. This is from this new word, kuro, kurara, to run. We, um, to run, it's misspelled on there. Uh, but we get words like current uh, from that. And look how weird it's, its third principle part is. It's kakuri. So it gets like this doubled up syllable in its perfect tense form. So somebody's running, but it's going to be like with speed, A or X, from his own citadel, Arx Arcus is citadel, they gloss out for us, in the sky, per nubes, per plus an accusative through, through the clouds, to earth, or to the land, Terum, he ran. So that is a whopping one, two, three, four, five prepositional phrases. The first three are ones taking ablatives. The second two are ones taking accusatives. But that's an action-packed sentence if I ever saw one. We'll start out with this one on Thursday. Again, tomorrow we'll just check the homework. I'll talk about what you can expect on the test. Thursday will be a quick video of me finishing this up and going over the vocab. And then Friday, like I said three times already, you'll take your test um online like e-learner kids always do just by printing it out and uh sit, like submitting it through the assignments or uh, just doing it digitally some kids know how to like digitally modify pdfs so let me know if you have any questions but again i'm using posts so please go to posts um to find content but for today i will make an assignment it won't actually be like a real assignment it's just going to be i'm just doing it because i know some of you guys are like you you know to look at the assignments but you don't necessarily look at a post but in general from now on look at my post subscribe to my youtube channel like and subscribe turn on the bell for notifications uh but that way like when i upload videos which i'll try to do before like 10 o'clock most weekdays until spring break starts um and you can just, you know, get it directly on YouTube. I guess I'll put it on files. I don't know if anyone actually watches my videos, like, on Teams. But I do tend to upload them to files. And they're just labeled here. There's a whole, I stopped sorting them into weekly folders, for better or for worse. But I guess I'll upload them there, too. Um, maybe let me know if you actually watch them on files. Because if no one does, I might just start using YouTube exclusively. Anyway, guys, all right, I will talk to y'all later. Let me know if you have any questions. Goodbye.